<coughs> welcome for this uh, <coughs> evening meeting. Uh, today we are going to have uh, <coughs> one very interdisciplinary endeavor uh, and we are so happy that uh, Joschka is able to offer that uh, also he has to be in quarantine. Uh, all our best wishes to the, for the recovery of your daughter and we are looking forward that he will be able uh, to come to Vienna very soon. Uh, and I don't want to speak, uh, to say uh, anything more. I just uh, would like uh, <coughs> uh, to ask you to give us our, your paper on the Battle of Muhi uh, uh, with regard to many disciplines uh, necessary for its analysis. Joschka, please. Thank you very much and thank you for coming to this lecture. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I'm glad to offer this first public lecture. I mean, we moved to Vienna, but because of this extraordinary situation, in the last minute, I turned out that I have to stay in my study room at home because I'm in quarantine because of COVID, but fortunately with Zoom, we can share this, so I'm, I'm sharing with you my work and experience. What I'm going to focus on is interdisciplinary research in medieval studies, since this is also connected uh, to a course in our uh, department. And uh, I want to use the example of the Battle of Muhi, which is one of the main targets of a large-scale investigation, a four-year-long uh, interdisciplinary research project led by Balaj Nagy, our colleague from uh, the department, but also with the participation of a number of Hungarian institutions, museums, other universities, research centers, and indeed with the participation uh, of uh, scholars from around the world when we are talking about lecture series or when we are talking about conferences connected to this. So let's start uh, with this one and uh, the, in the moment I've got problems with yes okay. So what about this new research project? It's about the Mongolian invasion of Hungary uh, but it's in a Eurasian context so it's dealing with the problem in a large scale investigation. It's a 40 year long project uh, which is composed of a number of research teams. I'm very much working with the archaeological research teams and the archaeology part of it is related to the publication of the relevant archaeological finds, new research on the Battle of Muhi which will be in the focus of our talk, my talk today, short, medium and long-term impact of the Mongol invasion. So we are looking much beyond uh, on, uh, on these issues. And obviously it's the integration of international research results uh, with the new Hungarian investigations. Now, if we just would like to put this story into the context, we have to recognize that it's really a large scale thing. So what you see here on this map is the extension of the Mongol Empire in a certain period around 1241. And it's very much to the very left side of this image where it's indeed depicted uh, the battlefield site Muhi or Mohi. Uh, but you can see that we are talking about uh, an expansion of an empire which included Central Asia to the Far East as far as Japan or Korea, uh, the Eastern part of Europe and indeed the Central part of Europe, Near East and so on. So it, in this respect, this battle is probably only just one event of a long sequence of events, but indeed sources are indicating and not only European sources but 
sources related to the heart of the Mongol Empire, that this was an important battle. Uh, and therefore, it's worth to investigate in this respect. Now, when we are talking about invasions, and of course, this battle is part of an invasion, uh, we very much focus on the written sources, the narrative sources or the chronicles. In some cases, in this case, also the Mongol invasion of Hungary is not an exception. You may find charter evidence, uh, which is connected to certain acts of persons who may receive a donation uh, after the event. Uh, literature, religious texts, sermons, poems, and of course, historical statistical data, which can be derived from the various types of sources and which can explain the situation before and after such an invasion. However, it's not only history which offers such a good basis for investigating this event, it's also archaeology. It is very clear that archaeology has got a particular interest in war, disaster, destruction. So archaeologists love fire, for example, because it destroys lots of things and it may survive in that way. We also have got battlefield archaeology, or as it is often called today, conflict archaeology. Uh, Archaeological research has identified long time ago that there are special sites and finds which are connected to this invasion, namely the hoards, which contain jewelry, coins, sometimes agricultural tools, which were hidden because of the invasion, and it, they came to light only centuries later. Destructive sites with traces of fire, with killing, and the particular unburied bodies or traces of killing, which we find more and more during the archaeological investigations. And in general, uh, like the historical uh, written source data or the statistical historical data can speak about the destruction of settlements, archaeology can speak about this as well. Now let's turn to the battlefield of Muhi or Mohi. Actually, in medieval sources, it is often uh, called Mohi. It's rather the modern name Muhi, but I'm using it. I, I learned it in school in this way, so I'm, I'm keeping that name. What you see in the image is this modern piece of art. This is the memorial site of the battlefield, which is actually near Muhi. But you also have to know that the present day village, what you can find on the road map, or if you Google it, it's not actually the site of the medieval settlement of Muki or Mofi. Because that settlement uh, disappeared, was destroyed, not in this period, or not only in this period, but it, has, uh, it was destroyed during the Ottoman period in the late 17th century and became an abandoned, deserted settlement. So this modern monument is actually not situated on a particular part of the battlefield. It was placed here because of the new modern road network to get there. We don't really know, and this is one of the targets of my talk, we don't really know any clear particular events of this battle and it's difficult, I mean we know them, but where it actually took place, that's the big question of this research uh, and I still keep this image in a way because it's a, a, an amazing piece of art in some ways and uh, uh, it represents the modern understanding of that historical event. But let's turn our attention not to the simply to the modern understanding, but let's turn to our attention to the medieval sources and the possibilities of doing research on this. Now, battlefield in this respect concerning the Mongol invasion of Central Europe are major sites and very important sites. It's not only Muhi, but it's also Legnica, Lignitz, which is in Poland, 
and it's very close in time. It was also a devastating event for the armies there. It was a very successful uh, invasion of the Silesian Polish areas by another military group of the Mongol army, which then came to Hungary and they joined forces. So these battlefields are important sites for research, but of course they are important uh, with their symbolic value as well. Now, if we turn our attention, if we turn to the sources, uh, we, of course, most important things are the written sources, and I will use some of them in my talk and in the examples, but let's see just two images, which are uh, those few uh, medieval images, which are about these battles. This one is depicting the battle, but of course, this is not uh, the real scene of the Battle of Legnica. It's rather a later imagination and depiction how uh, the, this battle was seen by medieval, but not contemporary people. The same is true for Muhi. In this case, we also have got an image which does not really have much of authentic source material for the battle it itself. The only thing is, which is very clear that it is on a bridge above a river and this must show that one of the most important elements of this battle took place there. And indeed, this is true. This is what we can figure out from the written sources. And it must have been a terrible battle event there. You see horses in the water, dead people, and things like that. So if you look at such images, you would assume, OK, archaeologists only should go there and dig them up and maybe find the traces. Unfortunately, that's not so simple. So let's turn now to research possibilities and research strategies. I'm also showing a modern artist imagination of the same scene. You can find many of such things. There are actually interesting videos, animations, and so on on the battle, what you can find on YouTube. They represent very different qualities. Some of them are really based on good scholarly studies. Some of them are more like imaginations, like the medieval image, what we have just seen. So uh, again, from this image, uh, the only thing what you can keep is that certainly one important element of the battle happened on a bridge, on a river. Uh, other details like the character of the bridge and so on does not belong to uh, the historical research uh, results. So uh, why I'm using this example? Because in the last some years, we have dedicated quite a lot of time to this research. And even before this research project I have mentioned, we started investigations. It started with a volume in 2003, which was published by, uh, edited by Balazs Nagy, which is still the big black book, as we call it, which is the summary of all the sources, lots of secondary literature collected and things like that. And it offers an excellent handbook for the research. And there, I've been asked to present what archaeology can offer for the research. And this started a long process. It's already 17 years now. And more and more information has been gathered by various people. And now in the framework of this new research project, we can actually evaluate these new results. And we are also looking for some new investigations. One of the earlier uh, summaries of these archaeological investigations or possibilities were done in 2012. Now, let's turn to the very topic of the talk uh, and the particular aspects what I'm going to present. So I would like to present a kind of research strategy. 
which is connected to this research project, particularly to the aspects I'm interested in. So first of all, in the first phase, we are doing a critical evaluation of the previous scholarship. And I only will show you an example of that, not the re-evaluation, the whole one. I want to show the reconstructions of the battle as an example. In the second phase, we are doing data collection and data analysis, but data collection and data analysis, not simply from archeological or historical sources, but from a broad range of interdisciplinary research, taking into account many other disciplines. Again, I'm using here an example, which is physical geography and hydrology of the site. In the third phase, I would like to show you some examples or one example how interdisciplinary investigation is actually working. So how these previous two steps can be combined with adding new types of data, adding new type of investigations, which all finally can lead to a complex analysis about which I'm just going to show you some hints because this would be done probably at the end of the research project. Now, let's see. So what I've done here, I've collected a good number of visual representations of the battle. I show you two, they are representing different periods, media and things like that. And what is typical for both of these representation, it's a kind of minimalist approach to be very simple and to indicate the most important thing. And in one way, this is true that uh, some of the most important events of the battle can be depicted in this very simple uh, schematic way. So what we can read out from the sources, range of sources, we have got some uh, sources which were produced in contemporary Hungary. These are Latin sources. We have got also connections with the written sources. We can uh, select a few important elements of the story. So one of the thing is that many sources are saying that it was connected to the Shoyu River. Uh, this is still an issue because some other sources would indicate other river names, but let's say many of these are connected. The second thing is that there was a bridge on that river and heavy fight occurred uh, on that bridge. And one of the key elements of the battle was that. But we also know that the Mongol army was able to cross the river with some difficulties, at least at other two points. Now this, where and how this happened is still a question. We also know from a number of sources that King Bela the Force has created a military camp which was surrounded by chariots. So it was a, had a, its own defense system. And then it was surrounded at one stage by the Mongol army, which originally was situated on the other side of the river, but then later as I mentioned, was able to cross the river at least at three points. And finally, uh, they surrounded the Hungarian camp, they defeated them, and then uh, the, uh, the army tried to, the Hungarian army tried to flat, and this was uh, the most destructive element of the battle. So if we look at these very schematic images, we may say, okay, uh, they depict some certain elements of the uh, battle, but we may ask, for example, how this river looks like, uh, what the swamp limit, which is indicated on one of the maps, on what basis these things 
have been done. Now, what I've done, I investigated these previous reconstructions. Of course, the military historical reconstructions as well, but also the maps which were attached to them. And they reveal quite a number of interesting things. First of all, so that was the image. Now, I just want to show you just for fun, let's say, what kind of interesting visual reimaginations were created. Uh, nice colorful maps and things like that. You can find them on the internet in a great number. Now, I also tried to look at them and wanted to figure out on what basis these things were made and how reliable are they. And I'm showing you a few examples because here the variations are quite interesting. It's like studying manuscripts. It's like a stemma, what you can put together in this case. And uh, you may find the original one, the original source the ancient Gesta or something like that, which is a military historical reconstruction. And then it has been redrawn, recolored, remade many different times. So for example, this is a different viewpoint. It looks very nice, but the basic thing is just like, you've got the river, the bridge, the Hungarian camp, and three possible routes of the Mongol army crossing that one. Or I show you another reconstruction attempt. Actually, these are somehow related to each other, but I would like to underline uh, that even on this map, for example, the river Shoyo, which is running here, it looks like a very simple, you know, straight river. The other aspect is what is interesting, that it is indicated that somehow, uh, in this case, for example, the Mongol army uh, led by Batu, so that part of the army, first had to cross the Hernad River and then to cross the Shoyu River. We do not have any sources which would mention this event in that way. And probably the reconstruction is based on uh, this reconstruction is based on the idea that we have got a village indicated on the map, which is called Shoyu Hidvig, which means a, a place situated at the end of a bridge on the river Shoyu. But unfortunately, this present day Shoyu Hidvig is not situated on the river of Shoyu, but it's situated on the river Hernad. So, the two rivers are coming together somewhere here near Muhi, but how this interfluve area looked like, that's still a question. Now, if we turn to this evolution of reconstructions, I show you this example. This is a, a fairly accurate uh, work, I have to say, depicting the rivers in much more details, uh, the settlement pattern is quite well depicted and things like that. But there is one element here which you can recognize, namely that in the middle of the image you see the shoyo, and in the left side of the image you see a much smaller river course, which seems to be quite straight, but actually this is one of the most meandering water courses uh, at the area, which is called Hayu. And this uh, seems to be there are two settlements and they seem to be connected to each other by a black line. And if you look at this black line, you can get probably the impression based on the drawing that it's a road depicting one settlement, which is called Hayu to, to the Shoyu River and probably to a crossing near the settlement Kurum, and that makes sense because even today there is a ferry crossing on the Shoyu at Kurum. However, probably somebody misunderstood that black line, and when you get to the, to the next image, which is a recolored version, I believe, of the same, suddenly what appears is a water course connecting 
the Shoyu and the Heyu River. So it looks like that somewhere in the middle of the Hungarian camp, there was a river or small water course running through. And this started to have its own life. For example, if you look at this nice artistic imagination, here it is actually quite clearly depicted that on the right side of the image, you see the big Shoyo River with the bridge, and then a water course is running out from it and goes through all the way the Hungarian camp. And there is no such water course. So there are, as you will see in the later part of my talk, there are lots of water courses in this area, lots of meanders, former riverbeds, but there is nothing. And there wasn't at all such a water course which connects the Shoyu and the Heyu. So what does it mean? It means that there was an original source of the reconstruction which wanted probably to be to depict a road which was misunderstood at one point and then started its own life and became a water course. So these are those things which we have to spend time on to understand to what extent these reconstructions which are circulating, they are in textbooks, handbooks, internet, animations and so on, whether they have any historical reality, what is their original source, and to what extent we can use them. Now, if we actually look at these images and we analyze them systematically, which I've done, I only presenting it the summary, uh, we may say the following uh, conclusions. Many different versions we have got, but only few original reconstructions so you can easily detect, after studying this, the three, four, five original sources of modern scholarship where these reconstructions were made. And the many versions are only results of recoloring, redesigning, uh, reanimating these things. The second conclusion is that the geographical and hydrological conditions of the area, which are important, we are talking about rivers, marshes, and so on, are vaguely depicted on these images, on these uh, maps, drawings, which are reconstructions. Even more, the medieval settlement network is rarely depicted. Often reconstruction is based on modern settlement patterns. So uh, we, we all know that the modern settlement structure of this area, which went through fundamental changes in the 13th century, in the 18th century, and so on, cannot be simply used as the basis of reconstruction. Still, many of these reconstructions, not all of them, used a modern settlement network. Environmental changes of the last centuries were not taken into consideration at all. There are few better examples where at least this rivers are not depicted as they look like today, uh, which uh, are rivers now after very serious modern river modifications and regulations, but even those which do not depict in a simplistic way these rivers, they do not take into consideration the many centuries of changes. And finally, we know that archaeological materials were not taken into consideration in this reconstruction. Now, then let's move on and let's say, what can we do in this case? How we can make a better, more interdisciplinary research? And showing, I'm showing you the example of data collection and analysis in this case which is about the geographical survey of the area. We are very fortunate because the geography department carried out very important investigation in this area and they are doing new investigation for us. Interesting aspect of the project that it's led by uh, Nod Bolash, another geographer. 
Now, uh, what are the what we what are the questions for this investigation? What what we posed for this research team? So we wanted to know what happened with the Shoyu and Hernad rivers uh, during these centuries. So what historical changes occurred? Taking into account the character of these rivers, we also wanted to see not only the rivers, but also the floodplains. And we also wanted to see one particular site. What is the explanation? Is there a geographical explanation for this strange place name, which I explained that at the end of the bridge on the Shoyu, Shoyu Hidvi, is now situated on the Hernad River. We also wanted to see the reconstruction, the possible reconstruction of the smaller water courses. And we also have got a particular question for them, which we hope to have in a growing number. So if we are able to identify various battlefield sites where something important happened in the battle, what is the geographical interpretation of those areas? How can we understand them? How did they look like? in the mid 13th century. Now, what they have done for this, they carried out an extremely detailed geographical survey of this Hernat Shoyu Hayu zone with their own methods. They based their research on geographical surveys, on old maps, on geomorphological studies, for which we have used a number of important uh, source materials. So this is uh, what you see on this historical map is the, I would say, more or less the modern river courses. So we are talking about to the left, this very straight one is the Hayu, the two one which is coming from the top, that's the Hernad and the Shayu, which then got together somewhere close to the battlefield. And after that, it's uh, only the river Shayu. And finally, on the right side, you have got the river Tisa, which is the greatest uh, river in the region. So this is an important aspect because we know that the rivers are play a crucial role. If an army is coming from the northeastern part of Hungary, which is in the upper right corner of this map, uh, and you want to get to the central part of the kingdom, there are various opportunities, but in a rather narrow zone, you either have to cross one, two, three, or four rivers if you want to get to another area. And this makes a big difference. If you are an army leader, you know that every river crossing is a kind of challenge. Every river crossing is a dangerous situation, particularly if you have got an army on the opposite side of the river. So therefore, this blue zone indicates the area where most probably we have to look for the battle area, taking into account the river crossing possibility. And if you actually look at this map, this amazing intricate system of meanders, former river beds, uh, and all kinds of things, this is the characteristic feature of the area. So it's not a straight river as it looks today. Now, how we can reconstruct these historical changes of the rivers? First of all, we have to identify the borders of the floodplain because nothing what is in the floodplain uh, is, uh, it means an area where we can't really do any more serious investigation because there probably most of the remains of anything, whether they are archeological deposits or other things were washed away by the river. And so if we reconstruct, there is this kind of edge of the floodplain in certain periods. Uh, we also have to see the situation that there are modern things. Uh, on the left side of this image, the bluish things are uh, the uh, big quarry areas because 
there are sand and gravel extraction in this area. So there are actually huge areas which have already disappeared and there we cannot continue anymore the investigation. And uh, we have to go on with this type of survey, for example, when we wanted to figure out uh, this strange place name, Shoyu Hidweg, and this is the geographical situation there, which shows clearly that the present settlement is situated right on the Hernad River, but right opposite on the other side of the river, there are a number of earlier river beds, and we also have got a higher elevated zone which can serve as a settlement place because it was never flooded. And in fact, this is the site of the earlier, actually medieval Hidwig settlement. So we see a replacement of a settlement, not only replacement of the river, but also replacement of the settlement. So we have to investigate this in a very detailed way. And this is what can be seen on this geographical survey result. Now, how this is done? We are very fortunate because we have got a LIDAR uh, survey for the area. LIDAR is an airborne laser technology, which is somehow scanning the surface of the, of the earth. And we, uh, we got the survey of the broader area of the battle which means that you have got a very accurate elevation of the surface. We are talking about decimeter accuracy in this case. What you see here are the modern settlements. This is Onod with its castle, and you have got on the other side the previously mentioned Shoyu Hidwig, and you can clearly see that the different colors here mean the elevation, the surface model of the area. And you can see that the two rivers dominated the zone between them. Now, I, what I also would like to show you, and this is a very remarkable, almost an animation-like thing, it is showing the river changes of the Shoyu River during the last little bit more than 200 years, roughly 250 years. It is based on historical maps, and these are quite accurate. So if you just follow, this is the present river course. And this is an earlier phase, actually the third military survey. This is the second military survey, and this is the first military survey. So enormous big changes in the river courses, and we are only talking about 250 years. And we can assume that similar changes occurred during the last 800 years. So how can you say where was the crossing point on the river? Where was the bridge on the river? This is not so simple. The, uh, the site catchment or visiting the present landscape and simply doing conclusions, making conclusions out of the present situation doesn't help us to understand how the landscape looked like 800 years ago. So this investigation clearly show the limits of our possibilities and at the same time indicate those areas where we can still carry out archaeological investigation. Again, just to give you an idea, it's a puzzle what you have to put together. What is the chronological sequence? of these water courses, how we can explain what happened. And the most important question, what we are posing for our geographer colleagues, what was the situation in the mid 13th century? Which is in some ways an unanswerable question, but in some ways we can at least identify certain elements of that reconstruction. Now for this, uh, just to give you an idea of what this LIDAR thing allows us, it's a profile, it's a cross-section in an area uh, depicted in this image now. We wanted to figure out where were the possible 
points where the two rivers could come together in an earlier stage, because it's absolutely clear that the present point where Hernad and Shoyu joins together is not the place where it was in the Middle Ages. Now, as a result of this investigation, uh, there is uh, a conclusion that it was probably much more to the north than it is today. And that means if the two rivers came together further to the north, the part of the Shoyu River or the part of the zone where you only have to cross one river is actually kilometers wider than it is today. And that's a very significant result for the reconstruction of the battle, for the reconstruction of the other possible crossing points. So the crossing point on one river is a serious question here. Now, let me give you another example, one possible battlefield area. Uh, we are talking about here the zone of the river. This is indicated in uh, yellow and one possible crossing area. Then there is a very broad zone where, based on the geographical evidence, we can imagine that certain events of the battle took place. And finally, we have identified one area which has been already indicated by historical sources, at least by some scholars, and which has been indicated by new archaeological data. This is not so much, this is not so close to the Shoyu, this is not so close to the cr possible crossing on the Shoyu, and it's much closer to the Heyu River. Uh, the site uh, has got a particular name. Uh, there is a water course which is called Kerengu Air, and interestingly, one scholar recently argued that the previously un unidentified uh, place name which occurs in one of the Chinese sources can be uh, identified as this Kerengu air. So the Chinese source gives a name of a water course, which is certainly not the Shoyu. Uh, there are other ideas which uh, uh, suggest that it's actually refers to the Hernad River, but this scholar argues that it's the Kerengu air. Now, if that's so, we have to look at this area. And we've been looking at this area not only because of this new identification of the place name, but also because already in the 19th century, scholars uh, carried out some kind of small scale excavations in the, and they were looking for various places in this zone as possible sites uh, of, of, of the battlefield or some elements of the battlefield. Now, the site is indeed quite an interesting one. There is a mound nearby, where, which is a higher elevation and it's surrounded by marshes of various water courses on three sides. What is even more interesting here that the archaeological investigations also led to a conclusion that probably something happened at this site. Now with this, I'm turning now to the third major element of the research strategy, which is now the interdisciplinary investigation in which, for example, we combine this natural geographical study, of course, which is also based to some extent on the historical sources, with the archaeological data. I have already mentioned in the reconstructions, when I talked about the previous reconstructions, that one of the shortcomings of many of these reconstructions is that they are not really using archaeological evidence, or they were not really using archaeological evidence. In a study, what we have published in 2016, we turned our attention to the archaeological, the possible archaeological sources, and we continue this uh, process now. So this is 
uh, indicating an earlier study. And for example, uh, there is one very clear site, namely the previously mentioned deserted, abandoned settlement, medieval settlement called Muhi or Mohi, where there's a large scale excavation and they found a double burial there. It's not a proper cemetery burial. It's not a proper grave. Two bodies were thrown into that pit, uh, but fortunately there were metal objects and coins found together and it's quite clear that they were warriors. There was, for example, a mace head, and they also were oriental type. So some of these objects were oriental type, and they are clearly connected to the Battle of Muhi. Now, of course, it's not easy to say that on which side they were fighting, because we also know that oriental type of warriors were also taking part in the battle on the Hungarian side. But this is one of the first archeological evidence which can be clearly and directly connected to the battle. And it's actually from the settlement called Mohi or Muhi in the Middle Ages. Uh, there was also a more detailed investigation taking into account the medieval settlement pattern. And in this case, the settlement pattern is not only reconstructed on the basis of the written evidence, which is namely charter, but based on archaeological surveys, particularly in the case of deserted, abandoned medieval villages. So we can put together and we can identify the settlement network and road network, not for the modern time, but for, let's say, the 13th century. And as a result of that, we can identify those archaeological sites. This is an example when we made a survey of that in 2018, which are clearly connected to this period. So we have got a red dot at the bottom at Hayu Kerestur, where one of the excavations found bodies uh, weapons in a settlement, which is clearly again connected to some kind of massacre, which occurred uh, in connection to the battle. We, we identified and the archaeological excavation found traces of this double burial at Mohi. And I've been talking about the former medieval site of Shoyu Hidwe. Now, if we put together this, this is already giving us a new type of archaeological evidence for the spatial reconstruction of the battlefield. Uh, I have to mention that uh, what you can do here is not simply battlefield archaeology, which is a very particular methodological approach. We are fortunate in some way that there was quite a lot of motorway archaeology in this area, which, is not the, which was not made on the request of archaeologists. It is that the area is close to Miskolc, one of the largest cities of Hungary. And so a motorway was constructed to that place. And during this construction work, several archaeological sites were identified and excavated, including the one I mentioned at Hayu Kerestur, including the excavation, the partial excavation of the medieval village and later market town of Mohi and some others as well. Uh, and if we put this together, then you can see, first of all, uh, we are also able to reconstruct a little bit the landscape of this area because these motorway uh, archaeological investigation and the battlefield archaeological investigation combined with this geographical survey now offers for us a much better hydrological reconstruction of the whole area. So if you just compare this image with that single type of water core system, you can see that it is a much more intricate system. But when we are talking about the reconstruction of medieval uh, landscape and environment, 
he can also turn again to the written evidence, not in a way that we are looking for actual descriptions of the battlefield, but we can look for descriptions of the region or one area. And fortunately, we have got some charters with perambulations. This is when the, board, the boundaries, the border of a village was identified in the context of a legal process. So when people were walking around the boundary of the village in order to separate it from the neighboring village, and this schematic drawing represents a perambulation, a going around the borders of the village, depicting natural landscape features, uh, some kind of marshy areas, uh, plowed lands, fields, but at the same time, former river courses and the river itself. This is schematic, so this is not a real map. You cannot simply identify on the basis of this, but this shows the sequence how the sites were mentioned one after the other as people walked around and then put it in writing the actual route, what they have followed to see how the border division between settlements can be legally uh, um, protected. So we are also using such type of sources to understand the landscape. And these description, although it's from the later Middle Ages, this is still much closer in time than our 18th or 19th century maps, what we can use otherwise. Uh, we already made an example of that in one study. I'm just briefly mentioning it. It's more for those who uh, are taking part in a course that we identified uh, a strange feature. We have got hills or mounds mentioned in the context of the battle, namely that Batu climbed a hill or a mound before the battle. And this, this is a very dubious, a very strange uh, element of the descriptions because it's flatland, it's the Great Plain. So what kind of mounds or hills these sources can talk about? And actually we, we looked at the eastern side of the Shoyu River and indeed there are some very significant mounds. They are so-called Kurgan sites, so burial mounds from the prehistory, which are still situated there. Some of them still survive and we investigated them to what extent, for example, you can see how far you can see from this because that was one of the elements of the one of the better descriptions that he was able to see from that mound as far as the Hungarian camp. So in this way, this offers us a new type of source material. And finally, in the archaeological context, I would like to mention something which is uh, one of the very new elements of our investigation, which is community archaeology which means large-scale metal detecting investigation. You see here these nice people gathering for a photograph with their metal detectors. And they are what we call them museum-friendly people. Some people are doing it as illegal activity and they work for the black market. These people are actually sacrificing their uh, weekends because of their hobby and they do it with us. We have got a strict protocol how they should do. And of course, what they are finding, this is not ending up in the black market, but it comes to the museums. And with this many people, or with this many people, they are able to cover huge areas, which has never done before. And these tiny little metal objects can actually offer us a brand new source material. Their spatial distribution can say more about the battlefield than any other possible sources of archaeological investigations. And this is what we are doing now with them. Just to give you an example, this is one of the sites which I've mentioned. So where 
uh, we, we started to focus on one area, partly because of the written evidence, partly because of earlier archaeological stray finds. And this has revealed something very interesting. It's just a small collection of finds, but these metal detector people found. The pictures were taken on the spot, so they are not yet restored. They are not yet cataloged in the museum as they appeared, as they were found on the spot. And if we interpret this site, and we are now getting to the interpretation, there's a very clear message from this particular site. All finds we have found are from the 13th century, except those which represent the Bronze Age settlement, which is, we are happy about that, but that's not our period. We also found different types of arrowheads. And the arrowheads are quite characteristic because some of the arrowheads belong to those types which we can call Mongol type of arrowheads. And it's even more striking because archaeological data shows it, and this metal detecting that there is no settlement in this area. So it's not a village site. It must be something different that we have got such accumulation of metal finds. And geographically, when we asked our colleagues from the geography department how they can reconstruct this site from the point of view of the original, or let's say the medieval or earlier environment, this is a small mound which was surrounded by marshes. At least three sides of the site is covered by marsh. So what we can reconstruct here is probably a place where a smaller troop wanted to withdraw and maybe use the protection of these marshes. And then they got into a fight. And most probably we see the results of that. We see the finds connected to this fight. It is certainly not the major, the most important battle area, but one of the possible sites of a fight connected to the battle. Let's give you another example, how archaeology can uh, do something in this respect. We are looking for forts and bridges on the rivers. And if you understand how much this river course is changed, that means that we are not necessarily looking at the places where you would expect them today. So what we are doing, we are investigating the riverbeds and some of the lakes nearby for traces of former uh, crossing points, including bridges. And fortunately, in some places, uh, even previous research has identified some timber constructions which survived in the river. And we are doing more and more underwater investigation of them. We are taking samples from these timber constructions, which can be dated with dendrochronology. This is the treeing based archaeological dating, which gives us very accurate dating in most cases. At, at this moment, we haven't yet got any of the, these timber constructions which are dated back to the mid 13th century, but we have already have got samples which are dating back to the 15th century. And that is much more than you would expect on the basis, for example, of studying historical maps, which can go back only to the end of the 18th century. So if I identify a bridge or a crossing point on the river on this map, that means that was the situation 200, 250 years ago. But what was the situation 800 years ago? That's still a big question and such archeological investigations can help us. Now, finally, if we put all this and we put it into a complex interpretation of the results, which is not simply uh, about the battlefield, but going back to the original concept of the research project, we want to see this battle as a part of the Mongol invasion. So we also have to contextualize the archaeological finds. 
We have to compare this battlefield to other battlefields. We have to look at the spatial distribution patterns of the historical and archaeological data connected to the Mongol invasion. What, what was the place of this battle in those? And with the help of these complex interpretations, we can formulate new research questions for the ongoing investigation. And to sum up and to finish my talk, let me give you an example for that one, or a few examples. First of all, it's not only the battlefield where we have got now traces of destruction, killing, and things like that. This is a famous image which appeared uh, quite a lot on the internet. This is from the Great Plain where a family tried to hide themselves in an oven of a house, two children and a woman, and they died there. So the settlement was destroyed, the house was put on fire, and they did not survive. Now, archaeological finds connected to such events and such places can help us to understand what happened during the Mongol invasion and not only during that one single battle. Why this invasion was regarded such a devastating event and what elements we can identify. This uh, means that you have got many of these sites now with unburied bodies, with traces of fire and destruction, when you have got very valuable objects which otherwise would not be uh, found. People were taking care about these very valuable objects, so either they were hidden or they were with them when they were destroyed, killed, and so on. So we have to see the desertion process as a complex thing. And if we put together all this data, this very colorful image, what you can see, is a new attempt where we put on a ma one single map various types of evidences. So it contains historical place names, places mentioned in narrative sources where particular destruction was described. It shows coin hoards, jewelry coin hoards. It shows some patterns of the road network. It also shows sites of certain place names which were somehow identified with the Mongol invasion. And the complex spatial analysis, the distribution pattern of this can reveal a lot about what happened during the Mongol invasion and to what extent the Battle of Muhi was, let's say, a starting point of the destruction in certain zones. Why we do not have this kind of data or only one type of data from an area. That requires an explanation. And finally, uh, it, the Battle of Muhi was not the only place where certain fight emerged. We learn more and more by archeological investigations, particularly in the Great Plain area, that people try to fortify churches with this type of huge ditches, which were excavated recently, at some places and more and more were identified, they heard about the danger of this uh, situation and they tried to protect with them uh, with this earthwork fortification. They tried to survive the invasion. And the archaeological investigation not only has revealed the various details of these fortifications, for example, here you can see one in the middle with the place of the church, which has been identified and this double deed system around it. And there are hordes and there are weapons and so on excavated. Just, as, just to give you an example, how we need to formulate new research questions and even try to develop new research methods. These sites revealed one thing, what we, could have expected before, but there was no clear evidence for that one until this time. Namely, that the Mongol army has also used arrowheads, not only made of iron, but of bone. 
This is known from Central Asia. Previously, no such finds were identified. But after excavating some of these fortification ditches and very accurately excavating them, archaeologists found samples for these bone arrow hats, which were used during the attack against these fortified, quickly fortified sites. Why is it important for us? Because this is a new information for us when we are dealing with the battlefield of Muhi, that we can do a very good work with metal detecting in order to find traces of fight, in order to find arrowheads and other weapons, but that method will not help us to find the arrowheads made of bone. How we can do that, how we can identify them, that's the next question for research. And so with this detailed investigation of another site in the Great Plain, we actually received a very important idea for further questions, not so much for solutions. And with this, I would like to stop my talk. And I hope I was able to demonstrate how many different disciplines, how many different approaches should come together that at one point, probably we will more understand the battlefield of Muhi and probably that monument, which I have shown to you, which is situated now there, can also have some information materials which will indicate where exactly and what happened in that region. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Yoshka, for the very fascinating presentation, which certainly will lead uh, uh, to a very lively discussion. But let, let me just ask, how many guys have been involved in this? And how was the communication with them? Did everybody understand what the other one said? Um. You mean in the project? Sorry, I... Yes, you, you often speak of we. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, is... yeah that's Rafi. right. That's a, that's a very relevant question. Uh, so we have got a core team. If I'm not mistaken, it means 14 people. And this represents historians, archaeologists, numismats, uh, orientalist specialist and things like that. So that's the core group. We have got a larger group of people who are somehow attached to the program because they are doing some type of research and we are cooperating with them. And this larger group is, I would say, around 30 people uh, and they represent a good number of other fields as well. So we have got there people uh, like uh, art historians. We have got people uh, who are, uh, for example, dealing with the restoration of the objects and they, they say something important for us. There are uh, uh, archivists who are collecting for us new written materials, archival materials, and things like that. So that's the, the second circle. Uh, we have got uh, another circle, which sample we had one weekend when we had 70 people who were working in the community archaeology program. So they dedicated their time to do metal detecting. Uh, and we rely on them. And that's the big group. So it's not always the same people who are coming. So probably if we would say, uh, just come, any, anybody can come who is connected to these uh, projects of museums, we may get 100, 150 people. So that's, that's the we. And of course, I also come to them 
that the research project has got also a broad international network because we, we have already organized some uh, meetings with them. We presented some results in international conferences and we wanted to have an international conference in the spring, which was stopped by the COVID, but we will have it at the end of November online. So that's, that's another aspect. So that's the V. Thank you. Que other questions and comments, please. May I have uh, one? Gabor, yes. Uh, you mentioned, Yushka, that you compare uh, the various finds uh, with other archaeological finds of the same uh, period. Is there in Poland, in uh, the battlefield of Legnica, uh, a similar enterprise, or has there ever been? Uh, yes, there were some investigations of the battlefield of Legnica, and there are some investigations, not as far as I know at the moment, not on the same scale, uh, but uh, that's also an important issue for us. And just to give you an example, how important is this international communication? For example, when I was talking about the so-called Mongol type of arrowheads, we have got a colleague from Slovakia who actually dedicated very important work to that one. And he has collected these arrowheads from the Polish area, from Slovakia and some from Hungary as well. So we have got now a good typology based on his work, which we can now compare with the Central Asian uh, data, which he also did to some extent. And that is the type of work which is essential for archaeology. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> Uh, I have a question. Yes, uh, please. If I'm not talking over anyone. Uh, now, obviously, there's a lot of very well-known narrative sources discussing uh, the movie, the movie battle. Um, but you've mentioned the charter evidence, um, and I've. I, sorry, the dogs making noise here. Uh, what what sort of material? are in the charters, if any, directly relating to Mui, and how have they helped in uh, this research process and this project? Okay, so the, I, would, um, I would mention charter evidence in two respect. One of them, which is uh, some of the charters has narrative elements. So for example, somebody receives a donation from the king and it's described that the reason to receive this donation, that this, this guy saved my life, was very brave in the battle, was uh, two of his brothers were killed when they were fighting against the Mongols and things like that. So we have got this narrative stories uh, recorded in charters. Uh, unfortunately, not so many actually for the 1241-42 Mongol invasion of Hungary, much more what is called often the second Mongol invasion, which took place in 1285. And there is a good number of, of uh, charter evidence connected to that event. In fact, uh, the strange thing is between the two events that why the 1241-42 can be very much reconstructed on the base of the narrative sources, either Hungarian or Chinese or whatever, the 1285 can be reconstructed much more in detail based on the charter evidence. And the second type of charter evidence is not so much directly connected to the battle, but we have a good number of charters which are saying this settlement is empty. It has been abandoned since the destruction of the Tatars. It may be just a half sentence, but this is an important one. And of course, if you put this data on map, then we can we can actually use to find out what was the level of destruction uh, around the battlefield 
or in the Great Plain, or in northern part of medieval Hungary, or in Transylvania. These are, of course, we always have to be careful with them because it doesn't mean that other settlements were not destroyed at the same time, but at least we have got direct evidence about some. So that's the character of the charter evidence. Yuri, please. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Good. So uh, uh, I would like to ask you a question concerning that map you put together on the basis of those evidence, uh, the different type of evidence. You have this map of medieval Hungary with all the evidence from uh, gained from archaeology whatsoever, narrative source and everything. And that implies to me uh, that it, uh, uh, as opposed to the so far um, somehow... Uh, um, imp implication uh, uh, that that there was a kind of route which which was more heavily uh, 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 influenced by this whole uh, Mongol invasion. Yes, this this what I mean. Uh, so it is kind of this uh, in the middle of the kingdom, not necessarily so much in the the northern part or the northwestern part, and so. But on the basis of this map, this, uh, I have the, the impression that, that this means that, that uh, the Mongol invasion uh, had then uh, overall uh, uh, it's uh, also a destructive uh, uh, in, uh, uh, influence. Or, uh, or you would interpret this map differently? Yes, I would interpret this map differently. First of all, I have to say that this is not my work or not only my work. Um, this map is partly a result of generations of scholars so who has collected the points. So one of the dots are the, all the coin hoards. And we are working with Beatrix Romhani a lot on new and new maps. Mm -hmm. because we are fascinated by these spatial distribution patterns. It fell a lot. So it is a little bit misleading. I just wanted to indicate with this image that how many different things you can put on a map mm -hmm. and it creates such a colorful image, but it would not explain what happened. For that, you really have to look which patterns overlap it's, with which mm -hmm and which patterns does not overlap and which occurs what. So just to give you an evidence, if we put one type of place name evidence on this map, it will nicely cover the whole Carpathian Basin. But mm -hmm. if we investigate this place name evidence in a more detailed way, it will show that one group of this place name evidence is correlating with the coin treasures in their spatial distribution which suggests for us that there is a relationship between the two things. Mm -hmm. Still, there are places which we cannot explain. You know, the mm -hmm. biggest problem is, for example, Transylvania. Mm -hmm. You we don't know what's going on. You, we have got quite a lot of written evidence which describes destruction and how certain places were devastated, but the other indicators which we are using, for example, hordes, they do not okay. appear in there. Mm -hmm. There are various explanations, and I also can say that uh, if we would put all the indicators, what we are now using, then it would be covered. So this map would be covered. So you really have to work on, on the details with that. Yeah, sure. Okay. I just wanted to hear your uh, explanation on that. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Anybody if, else? I was going to say, if nobody else has a question, um, two, two queries of different routes. Um, one of them, a broader archaeology question, because um, we started early on with how destruction is great for archaeologists. I was hoping that we could, obviously, destruction also destroys stuff. Uh, if you could speak a little bit about archaeologists, how they address, you know, if it's after a fire, everything is burnt, how you do the reconstruction of 
destruction. And the second one, given how many different methods are applied to this, uh, would you say that this would have been possible, I don't know, 30 years ago with older methods? Or is this type of research only possible, like, at present? Okay, so for the first question, I have to say that this is um, typically the inner contradiction of archaeology. When I said archaeologists love destruction, fire, and things like that, the reason for that, that uh, in a normal condition, for example, if you abandon a settlement in a peaceful way because you decide that you want to move to another place, you take everything with you. Okay, so not much is left for archaeologists. In the past, recycling was much more than even today. So people, to find metal pieces, for example, in a settlement, is not that frequent because you can melt them, reuse them, and so on. It's only pottery, which cannot be really recycled. That's why archaeologists are so occupied with pieces of potsherds and things like that. Uh, but if there is destruction, let's say the, the settlement burns down. And for example, it happens with a good number of settlements, there's nobody to bury the deaf people there or just to clear away and things like that. And that means that if there is no recovery for a certain time, then you may have sites where it's like a time capsule with all those indicators, with coins, with objects, with dead people, and so on. So that is, uh, but of course, if, you, if, you, if, if there is a recovery, let's say the people ran away and returned, then they would bury their people properly. They will clean away the destruction as much as possible. So that's, that is the particular aspect here. Now, to what extent this research was possible, let's say, 30 years ago or not? There are very good examples. For example, if we turn to another battlefield, namely the battlefield of Mohach, uh, already in the 1950s and 60s, very good research has been done, where, for example, all these aspects that you are doing field survey archaeological field survey, you are collecting the written evidence, you are uh, analyzing the narrative sources, you try to reconstruct the landscape, was present. But today we have got more and more amazingly good methods. I mean, for example, this LIDAR, which I have mentioned, I mean, it's amazing. You, you get so fast and accurate uh, survey for the, for the surface and then it can be analyzed by the experts. We are using satellite images and things like that. The metal detectors, there were already metal detectors, uh, you know, several decades ago, but the quality of them is now much better. Not to speak about the fact, which is of course the problem, that's why there are so much looting of archeological sites, that you can simply buy it on the market. And lots of people uh, are using it. And this is amazing. I mean, these guys, uh, I'm saying guys because, for example, in this whole team, there's only two women, I think. So uh, these guys are amazing. They spend so many hours with that. So they are so professional that none of us, let's say archaeologists, can do it in that good way. So that was not possible, let's say, 30 years ago. It's possible now. Catherine. Yeah, thank you very much, Joska, for the talk. And my question relates to the identification of the battlefield, that uh, you spend really enormous uh, lot of time, energy, attention in identifying the battlefield. Now, if you can narrow it down to a certain area, then does it... Uh, change our perception of the preparation of the army. So could it uh, come with the result that the Hungarian army was less incompetent or more incompetent? Or how uh, does it uh, reflect on the, uh, the two armies facing each other? 
Okay. Uh, yes, it's a very relevant question. And if you particularly go to internet pages, then you can see heated debates where their Bela was Bela the Force was a disaster in sense of military leadership or the other extreme that okay we almost won that battle okay it's it's it was almost two two but finally it was two one so something like that now i don't want to get into that type of discussion because i think uh, there is no evidence for that one but what we can really see for example there were always arguments whether the campsite which was selected by the Hungarian uh, side was a good one or a bad one. So in other words, whether the king had a clear idea what he wanted to do or not. Uh, first of all, I would say we still don't know where was the campsite. So anything, what you can read about this is speculation. I hope that by the end of the project, we have, we'll have a better understanding where was this campsite. And then you can take into consideration, uh, was it a well-protectable place? Was it really something which, uh, which based on a good military decision or it's not? Uh, the same thing is, I think we learn more and more about that. It is not that simple that, oh, the, the Hungarian army was not taking care about certain things because they, they did not expect that the other parts of the army can cross the river. Uh, that's true, they did not expect that one, but it was quite a strange decision. And we even know it from the Mongol side sources that it was not such a clear cut story that they crossed the river, it went fantastically and then it was an easy game to finish. So the more we learn about these actual details, I think the more accurate picture we can draw and really explain what happened there. So I, uh, you, you may ask this question, and then what if we figure out these things? I think this is actually, what is the scale? What is the size and so on? If you just look into the speculations on numbers. People are talking about 40,000, 60,000, 100,000 and things like that. I mean, what is the size of a camp if you want to fit these numbers into that one? Does it fit into the area and things like that? So this is what I think you can really do uh, with this investigation in a second phase of the investigation. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, maybe yeah. a second one. Um, so uh, when you were talking about uh, this crossing uh, of river, um, I thought about the level of the water that can vary. So uh, can we look for some sources, for example, for chronicles to discover what weather were during the battle days or at least before them? Uh, or any other sources for that? Yeah, uh, very good question, I have to say, and we are struggling with that one. And we can go in two different directions. First of all, we can go into the sources, the text evidence, and we have got something. Um, much later, some of the military leaders of, uh, of the Mongol army had uh, drinking party um it's recorded and they they had some drink and after that they started to quarrel with, with each other and they were quarreling about the battle itself who had the most difficult role and part and probably they were saying nasty things to each other but what we can learn from that one that uh, there was a major difference between the two parts who were crossing uh, the river, not on the bridge, but to the north and to the south. And so it was a very different condition. The argument was that 
for you it was rather easy, but where I had to cross, that was really difficult. Now, if you look at the present Shoyu River, to some extent you can understand the situation because in a few hundred meters, the character of the river can change a lot. Um, this is one thing. And you say water level. That's a very good point. Uh, today and in, during the last days was one of the highest floods of the Hernad River and was fairly big flood of the Shoyu River. And now you can see how much the landscape can change. Of course, we have no report what was the water level on an early April day in 1241. Nobody measured the water and wrote about it in a chronicle. But we have got evidence, at least for the last more than 100 years, when the water level was regularly measured, that the always highest period of water level is April for that river. Now, this is a very difficult question, whether climatic change and all these things means that it was the same or was not the same in Aprils of the 13th century. But we probably can assume that we are counting with uh, a high water level in the April of 1241 which would explain the difficulties of crossing, because if you have got a very low level, in certain places, it's very easy to cross. So that's, that's my answer for that. Okay. One last question, Maria. Thank you. I, I would like to have a question about the future of this project, basically. And what I'm interested in is how do you define where to do the field survey with this huge amount of volunteers? And what is the next target? Which area? Okay, the, the future is uh, uh, fuzzy or difficult because, because of COVID because uh, although metal detecting uh, with people is probably not a very dangerous activity because you do it in the nice countryside and not in a closed room and things like that. But it also means organization. We do it not simply that we just hit the, hit the road and go there and then these people are picking up the nice finds because this is a community archaeology program. So we need to have introductions to these people. We have to explain them what we are doing and you can't do all these things in open space. So we are actually struggling with this issue. Uh, how we are selecting the area, we, we are following two strategies. Well, One strategy right. is to cover the biggest possible area. So anywhere where is the vegetation allows us to work or it's not under uh, mud and things like that, we try to do work. The second is that we identify target places based on all possible information, uh, previous archaeological finds, written evidence, the old guy in the neighboring village, and this is not anecdotic, this is true. There was a guy who said he knows a place where people used to find arrowheads, and we found arrowheads there. So that information is important as well. So we go to these target places for an intensive search. The problem is that this is very time consuming. You have to go there, you have to organize these people and under COVID situation, this is not easy. So uh, that, that is a problem for us. The same problem that we had to reorganize all our workshops and conferences and things like that. We may do more of publication. You can sit at home and write articles and things like that. But we still want to do quite a lot because 
Now we really have the results from the geographers and we understand more about where actually we can carry out research. For example, they identified certain places with looked, which looked very promising, but they say we have got probably 40, 60 centimeter alluvial river deposit on the 13th century surface, which means the matter detectors will not find the finds there. So we have to find another strategy there. Okay, so Joschka, thank, you. Joschka, thank you very much uh, again for that presentation. And uh, thank you for that lively discussion. And uh, we are looking forward to our meeting uh, in two weeks when we, have, when we will have Elizabeth Gruber from the Institute of Material Culture of the University of Salzburg. Uh, and uh, we hope that all of you will be able to come again. Thanks a lot and have a nice evening.